morning. Good morning. Says the song. So uh, last week we had kind of a freak snowstorm, and um, I did the, some counting, and there were around five people who would be the same people as were here last week because of the young adult retreat and the, the snowstorm and the timing of it. So I decided to do the same sermon again, and if you're one of those five people, I hope that you'll be able to, to hear it again with some fresh eyes. But I just really felt like this was a crucial point in the story, and to, to, to have so many people miss it would just undermine what I felt like God was trying to do with this message. So um, many of you know that uh, I found the Lord uh, getting clean and sober, and walking the road of recovery. And like many uh, new Christians, when you find the Lord, you, you realize that you still have a lot of growing to do and a lot of really bad things that you might even still believe. And for me, one of those things was that um, I basically weighed my whole life by whether or not I stayed clean and sober for the day. And then this doesn't sound like a very bad thing. I mean, it's obviously, especially if you could die, if you relapse, I mean, that's definitely important thing to think about in, in life or death terms, but, but over time, that initial freedom of that uh, choice came to, to kind of bind me up. It kind of made me short-sighted about my approach to life, because uh, it didn't matter what I did, or maybe even who I hurt, or how immature I acted, um, I became quite selfish, and I would lay my head on the pillow at night, and I would feel completely justified in all kinds of, of things that I shouldn't have done because I just basically thought, well, I didn't get, uh, I didn't get loaded today, so everything is fine. And I remember one day I was talking to my pastor, I was a new Christian, and uh, something in our conversation, I don't even remember what I said, but something in that conversation came up and I, I made a comment that hinted at this kind of pet heresy that I had, that I could measure my whole life by that. And so alarm bells were ringing for my pastor, and he, he, uh, he confronted me. And he, he gave me this really simple message that made all the difference in the world to me. He basically said, you can't, you can't weigh your whole life by whether or not you stay clean and sober. It doesn't sound like earth-shattering words probably to you, but for me at that time, it made all the difference in the world. It really convicted me, it brought me to a place where my whole worldview was expanded. And he didn't just stop there. He went on to talk about Jesus' vision of righteousness that was far beyond my vision of righteousness. Because my vision of righteousness had everything to do with just my actions. And uh, this pastor pointed out that Jesus, uh, he didn't lower the bar. He actually raised the bar to go well beyond just our actions and, and our motivate, to our motivations and just our hearts. And so this new vision of righteousness really captured my imagination and really uh, pushed me out of this place that I was stuck at in my walk. So um, a little truth can go a long way. You know, a little truth can be the, the thing that opens up the doors to a whole world of truth. And uh, for me, it was like someone had opened up a floodgate of truth in my life. It's kind of a watershed moment. So a little truth goes a long way, but uh, Jonah was an unlikely messenger. He was angry and rebellious. Jonah had a hard heart for the people that God was calling him to bring his message to. God was sending his prophet to another nation, a, a pagan nation, a nation that had buried many of Jonah's fellow Israelites, a nation who would later carry off ten tribes of Israel of the twelve into an exile from which they would never return. To Jonah, God could never extend mercy to such a sworn enemy. Now, the only acceptable action of God would be to destroy these people, and perhaps the sooner the better. I want to read from you, uh, for you a little bit of the book of Nahum, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And uh, I think this captures the sort of animosity that Jonah perhaps believed about the, the city of Nineveh, the Ninevites. It was a broken city, uh, known to be a center of violence and hatred and, and strife in the world. And so, um, Nahum 3, 1 through 7. Woe 
to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey, the crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and full of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who, say, who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh, who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? This is perhaps, uh, this is the message from after the exile. This is how the Israelites felt after this horrible, um, you know, really apocalyptic event happened to, to this people. But I think in many ways it still captures probably how Jonah felt about the Ninevites. This is perhaps the message Jonah would have liked to bear to the city, rather than God's message of mercy that he was actually called. And so um, Jonah had good reasons to feel this way. You know, these, this was a rival uh, nation that had been an enemy for a, a long time, done a lot of horrible things to people. And uh, so Jonah was an unlikely messenger because hate, his hatred was a huge obstacle to him being faithful to proclaiming the message he was called to bear. Um, an obstacle that even became an excuse for him to refuse to obey God. But Jonah was also the perfect messenger for some other crazy reasons. Uh, the Ninevites had this strange affinity for a fish god named Dagon. And uh, he went by a couple other names in the ancient Near East. But in, in, in some cases, uh, Dagon is portrayed as kind of like a merman. He's got the, the lower body of a, of a mermaid, you know, and the top of a, of a man. He's got like this kind of, you can't tell if he's got a fish head and a person's head, because it kind of looks like he's got like a fish hat, or maybe like a fish hood. So this crazy uh, fish, fish god that these people worshipped. Um, and, and he was worshipped because uh, he was... He personified some of this mentality that the ocean, with its abundance of fish, was really the center of, of the way that maybe God provided for the world. It was the center of human culture in this people. And uh, it, was, it was worshipped as the source of nourishment. And so uh, later there, there came to be this sidekick to, to Dagon, who was known as Oannes, who reportedly came out of the sea to teach people wisdom. Oannes is only one letter different from Jonah's name in Hebrew. And this might be the greatest kind of proof that there's any historical validity to Jonah at all. Um, this guy who comes out of the, the sea to teach the people truth. Um, it's speculated by some scholars that, that after Jonah came and proclaimed his message that he was later kind of uh, lifted up and exalted beyond just being a person and that his story lived on in this kind of worship of, of, of the, him as a character, as a, a normal person who was bearing this message of truth. Uh, there's an Orientalist, uh, which is what they call the ancient Near East, um, uh, a scholar named Henry uh, Clay Trumbull, and he was lived in the 1800s, and he wrote this, I want to read for you. What better heralding as a divinely sent messenger to Nineveh could Jonah have had? than to be thrown up out of the mouth of a great fish in the presence of witnesses on, say, the coast of Phoenicia, where the fish god was a favorite object of worship. Such an incident would have inevitably aroused the mercurial nature of oriental observers, so that a multitude would be ready to follow the seemingly new avatar of the fish god, proclaiming the story of his uprising from the sea. As he went on his mission to the city where the fish god had its very center of worship, so Jonah's disobedience and this whole detour that led to him being swallowed by a great fish was actually used by God powerfully, perhaps, to, to show that Jonah was really from God, that his message was very important and worth listening to. 
It's amazing how God can use even our disobedience in big ways sometimes. So Jonah's disobedience actually became the vehicle of him getting a wide hearing. You know, we, we know from Scripture that his message proclaimed all the way up to the ears of the king. And some scholars speculate that Jonah may have been bleached white from head to toe with his experience with living three days in the belly of the fish. So Jonah would have been quite the sight to see, this kind of albino prophet, this crazy guy who walked out of the sea one day to bring a message to these people. And that was a stir big enough to, to get the attention of the king in what was perhaps the largest city of the world at that time. So Jonah's simple message spread like wildfire. A little truth can go a long way. And uh, I think sometimes we deprive people of a little bit of truth that we have because it can be socially awkward for us. You know, we don't want people to think that we're judging them and often sharing the truth can be perceived as that. Sometimes the truth doesn't come in very pretty packaging. Sometimes even a message like 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown can be a big red flag on the trailhead that leads people back on the path of repentance. Jonah had only nine words of truth in our language, but they led people to repentance. The words didn't lead to converting the pagans, you know, as, as some people might read into this story. It didn't turn the Ninevites into Yahweh worshipers. It just uh, brought them back from where the, the dark path that they were headed on. And so uh, it did lead, lead to an end of the violence that plagued the Ninevites, which was this horrible atrocity that had been going on for a long time. Now, if you were, and I were Israelites and we heard this story, uh, of, of repentance coming from a place like Nineveh, um, we would be very skeptical. Just like we, you know, Nineveh had that kind of connotation like we might have for like Las Vegas today. So it's, it's this dark place. And to hear of repentance coming from this place you know, would make us ask ourselves, how complete was this repentance really, you know? Could it really be that the Ninevites, these strangers to the, the one true God, could they really repent? And just in case we might be doubting this, the author tells us that the message reached all the way to the very height of the social ladder, and the proclamation from the king reached all the way down from the, the highest of people in society to the lowest of people to society, and even beyond that to the animals who were commanded to participate in this repentance, this act of repentance. You know, even the animals were called to join in the fasting. I think that's a very remarkable point. And I, and I think in our culture, we, we often come from English stock, you know, I do. Um, and, and from that, that the kind of culture that we've inherited, we look at, at the world through the idea that we should have a stiff upper lip. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have these wild, especially Quakers, we shouldn't have these wild emotions running through us, causing us to do these crazy actions. We have a big distrust for emotionalism. But in ancient cultures, if you were broken on the inside, the way that you would show that is actually to let it affect you on the outside. You would, um, you would fast. You would maybe sit in the dust as the king did. You might tear your clothing and put on sackcloth and ashes. This was part of, of repentance, part of letting that pain out into the world. And you or I might be puzzled at such behavior, but I assure you that the king of Nineveh wasn't just a big drama queen. You know, that's not what he was shooting for here. But he was making a very public statement that this was personally affecting him and that he was leading his people in a new direction. And what this communicates to an ancient audience is something that, we, that they would not have missed, that the repentance was real, that the repentance was thorough, and that it, it went all the way to the, the farthest point that it could go. The pagans, they gave it their all, putting themselves wholly before God and crying out in the hopes that, that God would see their repentance, see that they were trying to turn a new leaf and give them another chance. And this is really the scandalous question at the heart of the book of Jonah. Is God's grace big enough for the worst offender? Could God's mercy even be extended to the enemy, to the pagan, 
uh, who really, really repents. And we might ask that question a little bit different in our time when we speculate about such things. Often we would say something like, what about Hitler? You know, he was like a slime ball. He was like the worst excuse for human, a human that ever walked the face of the earth, right? He did the, some of the worst things that we can imagine. What if he, what if he was on his deathbed and he really repented? I mean, really repented. Would God's grace be big enough for that? That's the, the sort of question that's being asked here by the book of Jonah. And I guess we'll find out if it's big enough next week. God uses unlikely messengers, but he takes the truth all the way. Sometimes truth can't be sugar-coated. It can't be diplomatic. It just has to come out. And sometimes the truth can hit you like a, in the face like a ton of bricks. As we uh, look at Jonah's example, we might ask ourselves if we're willing to bear that kind of truth if God is directing us to. So often for us, it, it might not be our hatred for others that's the obstacle to us proclaiming the message that God has called us to bear. Often it's usually our fear of the hatred of others. We're afraid that people won't like us. They might find us annoying and turn their backs on us. What does it mean to us on the other side of the cross to be people who bear the message of the gospel? I think the message that Jonah bore, um, the message that brought a whole city to its knees, is pretty insignificant compared to the message of the gospel. If in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, could turn around the whole city, imagine what the world would look like if we were more willing to bear the message of the gospel, uh, proclaiming it, and actually letting the truth come through us instead of putting it under a bowl as we're often tempted to do. We forget the explosiveness of the message that we are called to bear. We forget that God wants to use us to help him to change people's lives, people that he cares about, and that uh, to, to help them find the path to repentance, the place where it begins for most of us. Repentance is a step toward forgiveness, and forgiveness is a step toward reconciliation. And for reconciliation, all things are possible. He didn't want to help them uh, find what he had found, the mercy and grace of God that he knew was there for them. You know, uh, we live in a broken world, and I think it, it makes the news every night we can see how broken our world is. Uh, people doing school shootings and, and horrible things happening in the Middle East. And it's, it's like the end of the world cuts to commercial every time that we watch the news at night. And often we can get stuck on trying to, to fix a broken world. I think it's worth trying to fix. I think as Christians we have a vital role to play in that as witnesses to the world, but we forget sometimes, and the book of Jonah reminds us, that we don't have to fix the whole broken world before we can be faithful in bringing the message that God has called us to bear. We don't have to, to, to fix the world before God can use us. And Jonah isn't even a good example of what we like to, to hold up, like this idea of, of loving people into the kingdom. Jonah didn't love the people, even, that he was called to bring his message to. You know, and I think it's, it's proof that the message itself is of value, that the message itself is the thing that God uses in a powerful way to reach people that he loves. So Jonah wasn't a prime example of, of trying to love the Ninevites, but it was the message that led people to transformation. And I think if we're honest, our message as Christians is confusing. It's difficult to comprehend. It's brought from broken people like you and me uh, who fail at times to live up to the message that we proclaim. The problem we have, like Jonah, is that we largely run from the message. We've hidden it under a bowl. We have made church about nearly everything else but proclaiming the message to the world. We have made it about business and busyness. We have made it about fundraising for our own comforts. But the truth is, it's all about the message. That's what we're doing here today, is we're learning, hopefully, how to be a people of a message that we share with the world. And if we only get out of the way of that message, God might use it to transform people's lives, whole cities worth 
of people's lives. This city's worth of people's lives. The truth may not be pretty, but some people, as my story at the beginning of this sermon illustrated, some people are lost without it. Some people might uh, be confused by the message. They might misread it as a threat. Some people might never turn away from their wicked ways and, and turn toward God. It's just the truth. But if we hide the message, we're actually hiding the truth. And when we let our fears about sharing the message replace our faithfulness to do so, we're trying to hold back the infinite grace of God, just as Jonah was. So as we go into our time of open worship, I just uh, want to invite you to wrestle through what it means to be a messenger. Um, what it means to be a bearer of the gospel in the world, in the places that God has called you to be. And, and what would it look like, perhaps, to let the truth come out, pass through us, and, and reach the people that God wants it to reach? So as we go into this time, I just invite you to, to settle into the silence. If you would, just please wait a couple minutes before you <coughs> share and just let the, the silence sink in. And if you feel led to, to share something with us today, to be a, a person of a message, then I invite you to stand and a microphone will be brought to you. Thank you.